Hey, what's up everybody? Chad Kalick here. Hello. Before you guys get into episode number 86, I just wanted to let you know that after releasing the Q&A episode a couple days ago, I did get a lot more requests from people to do a special podcast series on Paranormal State. Like, I don't feel like it's a person standing in a corner, and I just think, oh, 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 me! Whoa, Chad, throw oh, down. Calm Something down. just grabbed my hand. Like, grabbed my fucking hand. Oh, right, I just got pushed. No, right now? Yes. All right, calm down. Me. Now, initially I thought that was such a long time period and so many seasons that would be such a big special podcast series, which by the way, these, I, I call it a special podcast series, but it's actually more like an audio book because I'm just sharing my experiences behind the scenes and just kind of unloading all the information that you guys, you know, don't know about um, all those cases and the entire experience. So if you like audio books, it's really kind of the same thing. Um, but I initially thought, man, that's just really big. That's a long time period. But one of the benefits I get from doing the special podcast series is that it makes such a cool record of my experiences for me, which I love. So after thinking about it, I definitely want to do it. And I'm going to do it, which is what I'm announcing right now. Um, it's going to be 20 episodes long. It is called Paranormal State Uncensored. And if you order it right now, right now there's a link below, you will get all 20 episodes at once on Christmas, December 25th, 2019. That gives me plenty of time to record them the way I want to record them. Um, you can also gift this as well. Um, how it works is once you order, you just get an email from us saying, hey, here's your private link. You download it, go to a private page. You can download all of them and keep them and store them wherever you want and watch them. And you'll be given a password to each of the 20 episodes as well. So if you want to gift it to somebody for Christmas, it's really easy to do that. All we need is the person's name and their email address. And you can just let us know when you order the series. So if you want to order it, like I said, for the next 24 hours, if you order it right now, you can get all 20 episodes on Christmas. And if you wait after the next 24 hours, then they will just begin on Christmas where you'll get one every seven days that'll be sent to you. So having said that, thank you guys for letting me know your wants and desires and your thoughts and ideas. I always want to bring to you the things that you want. So very cool. Having said that, enjoy episode number 86 of the Inner Credit Room podcast, which is one of my favorite episodes ever. I think you guys will see why. Um, have fun, enjoy, and we'll talk soon. Peace. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Chad Kalick, and welcome back to the Intercredit Room podcast for episode number 86, which I'm going to share a story with you guys simply because it was one of the most inspiring chain of events that I've ever lived through. And this is actually in response to a letter that I got from a gal who wrote me from North Dakota, and she's 27 years old, and she was considering moving to Hollywood. Um, it was uh, a consideration she had been making for years now. Uh, in fact, she said five years. She's been trying to decide if she was going to move out here or not. Uh, she wants to be a filmmaker, uh, not a documentarian, of, uh, a director of features, fictional films. And she basically had a line of questions about the odds. Like, what are the odds of making it out here? And, you know, whenever people ask me about the odds, it's, it's always a weird... A weird question for me because I don't think the odds matter. I mean, I know that sounds like a crazy response because of course the odds matter, right? Like, what are my chances? But A, you'll never know your chances until you come out here. But the odds matter only to those who who lose, I guess, if that makes sense. And if that's what you're planning on doing, losing, then yeah, you should not come out here. Um, but I just wanted to share a story 
Um, her name is Kelly, and Kelly, I hope you hear this because it's just something that I lived through again that was really influential, and it's something that is well documented in a documentary of mine that will be coming out hopefully in 2020, if not 21, called A Clown Short of Destiny. Um, but when it comes to the odds, I just wanted to share this with you. When I was in college, I had gone to college on a baseball scholarship that literally just paid for my books. After hurting myself at the first practice that I ever went to, I completely abandoned the whole pursuit of being a Major League Baseball player because what I had realized is baseball was just basically my way to, to get away from home. It was my way to get into the school I wanted to go to, and I didn't want structure in my life at that time. Um, but I still wanted to do something you know, with my life. And at that time, if I wasn't going to play you know, baseball, and I had, I had chosen journalism because I knew I liked storytelling as my major, but I wasn't sure what route or aspect of storytelling that I wanted to take because you can be, you know, obviously a journalist, you can be a writer, you can be a filmmaker, you could be a musician. And being a musician is where my real passion lied. I love music. I love playing music. I love singing. I love performing. I love writing. I love recording. I love everything about music. But I'm a total metalhead. And living in Iowa and going to school in Ames, Iowa, at that time, uh, uh, there was maybe two or three bands that were even hard rock. I mean, everything was dominated, and I mean dominated, by like folk music, acoustic music, basically cover bands that played classic rock at FAC, which is Friday after class, which is like when school would get over on Friday, you'd go to all the bars, and there'd be guys in the corner just playing acoustic classic rock songs, your typical Stones, Bob Seger, uh, all the way up to modern stuff like, you know, Dave Matthews and stuff like that. Not my cup of tea. Um, so wanting to get involved in music, I basically joined a band with my brother, and it was called Seasons Calling was the name of the band. And it was really, it just wasn't right for the time. I mean, at that time, the biggest bands and the things that were huge that were going on like across America was uh, it was like at the tail end of the Seattle movement. And it was like at the very beginning of the kind of 311, you know, uh, new metal, you know, corn, Limp Bizkit, Deftones type of movement. And the band I was in Seasons Calling with my brother, not that it was bad. It just it, it was very much an homage to like old, uh, you know, heavy metal, like uh, uh, Queensryche and stuff like that. Like it was just not right for the time. And I put a lot of effort into that band and we made an album, like a six song EP. And it just wasn't going anywhere. And to be honest, my heart wasn't really into it. I didn't see a real future with it. It did not inspire me to dream to bigger things. Um, but while playing in that band, we actually played a show where a band opened up for us called 35 Inch Mutter. And it was their first show. And they were very much at that time kind of in the same vein as Rage Against the Machine. And this was literally, you know, before Rage was even big. I mean, this was Rage had, had they had came out, but their album wasn't even big yet. So the only other band I had ever heard that sounded like Rage Against the Machine was Rage Against the Machine. And, that, and what I mean by that is, if you haven't heard Rage, they have hip-hop vocals over, like, funk and metal music. Uh, so it was, like, combining rock with rap. And I was like, this is dope. Like, I could see this could be big. This could be huge. Um, but again, they had a band together. They were doing their thing. So I just kind of kept my ear to the grindstone. And I heard through the grapevine that their bass player was actually a college student that was going to be graduating and leaving. So I tracked the drummer down and I was like, yo, I will do anything to join this band. Okay. I think this band is super dope and I think we could actually go somewhere. And I remember after trying out for him, it became really obvious, I think, to everybody in the room that 
this was legitimately a perfect fit. I mean, I came in, I knew all of their songs, I nailed them all first take, and I was just, I had never felt that kind of excitement. And it was a kind of excitement that made me dream. It made me believe, like, we could make it. Now, when I say make it, what I meant at that time is make a living. Like, we could, you know, do this to the point where we could, you know, get a big enough fan base, regionally at least, to make enough money to pay our bills. And that, to me, was like my goal. Okay? So... We started playing shows, and it was, man, it was rough. It was rough. I mean, just there was nowhere to support this music. Nobody wanted us. Nobody wanted us uh, to play at all. Like, nobody got it. I mean, everybody was just like, this rap rock shit. What is this? And so Dave and I, the drummer, we started talking, and we were just like, we've got to find a way to play a club because no clubs would book us. You know, like, uh, or the clubs that did book us were like these, you know, super small, like nothing. You know what I mean? So we needed a home base, a place that we could make our own. And, you know, Dave ended up getting a job as a bartender at this bar called The Long Shot. And then they hired me as a bouncer. And basically, we took control of this club so we could book our band there. And we convinced them to give us like Tuesday nights. And they did. And there was no stage. We would just set up in the corner of the bar and play. And I can tell you that nobody cleared a room out quicker than us. I mean, when we would start playing, that bar would fucking empty, man. Because, again, no one understood it. But I knew that we were writing music that was really really cool. And the more and more we wrote those songs, the more and more I believed we have a real shot at this. We have a real shot at this. Now, the one thing I did not have, and neither did anybody else in my band at that time, uh, we did not have money. And I mean, no money. And at the same time in Des Moines, Iowa, there was this guy named Sean Cran that had a similar idea. Uh, to start a metal band. And the one thing uh, Sean had was a ton of money. He was a rich kid. And he had put together different variations of this band that eventually became Slipknot. Um, now, this is pre Corey Taylor. So at the same time that we're writing music and we've got this one bar that we could play, uh, you know, Sean Cran, the clown, uh, he goes by clown, still to this day goes by clown is in Des Moines, and he's putting together this band, Slipknot. And they're trying to do the same thing. They're trying to play metal in a community that just simply doesn't support it. There isn't any clubs, not one, not one club played live metal music, heavy music. But what I knew is, I knew, I knew there were others like me throughout the entire area that loved like hardcore music. And I knew there was a lot of them. And I never looked at, you know, there being no scene as a negative thing. I looked at it as a positive thing, meaning if we could break through somehow and get our music heard by the masses, then I believe, you know, positive things will happen for us. And I believe that we could, you know, I, I really did. I started believing and dreaming big and thinking, you know, we can sign a record deal. Like, things could happen for us. So about a month or two went by, and we just kept playing the long shot on Tuesday nights, kept clearing rooms out. And slowly but surely, a few fans started showing up. You know, at this point, we had no album. We had no record. We were doing everything just word of mouth. And I heard a rumor that there was some national band that was coming to People's Bar and Grill, which People's Bar and Grill was... Uh, the live music club in Ames. It was named like one of the top 100 live music bars in the nation by Playboy magazine. Um, whenever there was a national band that was signed that did a club show in Ames, they would do it at People's. Well, we heard there was this band signed to Universal called Outhouse, and I don't I don't know who they were. I had never heard their music. Uh, they did not become huge in any capacity, but they were national. 
And, you know, we had heard that they were looking for an opening act. Well, it just so happened that the four or five, you know, uh, opening acts that Peoples would usually call upon to play these types of shows, it just so happened that they were all busy or couldn't do it or members were in weddings and stuff like that. So literally they were going to take anybody. Um, well, our drummer, Dave, knew the owner of Peoples and just said, hey, our band, 35 Inch Mutter, we'll, we'll open up for Outhouse. You know, it's a national show. It's a chance for us to play Peoples. We'll totally do it. Now, we didn't fit at all. Like Outhouse was a total soft rock radio kind of pop rocky band. And here we are like, you know, we're, we're like rap mixed with like New York hardcore. <laughs> so we did not work at all. But we looked at it like it's just a step up. It's a way to not play the long shot again next Tuesday night. So we did it. We showed up, we played, and there was hardly anybody there, maybe 30 people, which for us was kind of a record at that time. We were like, wow, hey, 30 people, that's killer. But the most important thing happened when we were there. The promotions director from Laser 103.3, which was the commercial rock station, uh, they were the big commercial rock station in all of Des Moines. They reached the largest audience. They were owned by Clear Channel. They were like the big deal. Uh, the promotions director was at the Outhouse show because that show was one of their shows that Laser 103.3 promoted. He saw our band play. Afterwards, he came up to me and he was like, dude, I am the biggest Rage Against the Machine fan in the world. I love this band, Snot, which was another rap metal band that had just gotten signed out of California. And he was like, I think you guys are just as good as those bands. Dude, you've got to get me a record, man, because we're looking for a local band to kind of wrap our arms around and support. And this was music to my fucking ears. I was like, what? Like Laser 103.3 is looking for a local band to support. They want to play them on the radio. I'm like, wow, that's freaking awesome. So right away, I'm like, we have to go in the studio and record a record. But again, we had no money. We had literally no money. We had nothing. So we scraped up all the money that all four of us had, and we came up with $400. We scoured the earth to find somebody that would record us. And this guy named Brad Heck, out in the middle of nowhere in a barn, literally in a barn in Iowa, brought us out and agreed to do a six-song EP for us for $400. They were live recordings. We just set up no metronome, no tracking system. It was just straight, uh, you know, two-inch tape. You know, we had enough time, literally mic up, play, and then he'll mix it, and that's your album. <laughs> so our album was a straight live performance all the way through. No overdubs, no second chances at anything. This is it. But hey, it was an album, and it was the first time that we had ever actually heard ourselves play. And I remember listening to, to it afterwards and going, wow, this is actually really, really good. Well, at the same time, I had heard a rumor that there was this metal band, Slipknot, that had taken over SR Audio in Des Moines, Iowa, which was the very expensive studio. They had booked out all the time. They had locked it down, and they were in there for months making this album, Mate, Feed, Kill, Repeat. And uh, that was Slipknot's first EP they released in Iowa. And again, they spent thousands of dollars and spent months on this thing. We spent 38 minutes <laughs> making our album. We plugged in and played for 400 bucks. And uh, Slipknot was also trying to get local radio support because uh, we all kind of knew that was the key to success. And so the weirdest thing happened at that time. Uh, Slipknot... Uh, they did not get support or love from 103.3. Uh, Sean Elliott and the guys down there, the promotions director I was talking about, that Sean Elliott and Troy Hansen, they, they just, they didn't get it. They didn't get Slipknot's earlier album. And if you ever, you can go listen to Mate, Feed, Kill, Repeat on online right now. And that's Slipknot without Corey Taylor. 
uh, there's a guy named Anders that is singing for them. And I, I've loved Anders. I just thought he was just dope as hell. But it's so heavy. I mean, like, I could see why people just didn't gravitate to it. Because it's just, it's just really heavy to the point something was definitely missing. It, it did lack, it, it lacked melody, it just it, of any kind. It, yeah, just something, it didn't work, okay? And it didn't work for Laser. But there was a gal named Sophia John at the locally owned radio station, 107.5, which was a pop radio station. Like, they're playing Britney Spears. Like, that's, like, I'm not kidding. So they would play Britney Spears and then Slipknot, you know? So this, this gal liked, they found a gal who liked their band, like Slipknot, Sophia John was her name, and she started spinning them on 107.5 and we started hearing this band Slipknot on 107.5 and I remember thinking well I mean if they have airplay you know they're they're going to get a big audience just because of you know if you get airplay you know you know music is so subjective that there's going to be somebody who digs it right so in a way, that kind of in, inspired me. I was like, wow, they're getting some love, you know, from 107.5. And at this point, nobody knows that 103.3 has talked to us privately and said, make an album. So at that time, because we're the only metal band in Ames, Iowa, and they're like the only, you know, hardcore band that's heavy enough for us to play with in Des Moines, Iowa, we reach out to Slipknot and say, let's start doing shows together. Um, and we did. We started playing shows all the time together. And um, it was weird because uh, nobody really came to see Slipknot. And nobody really came to see us in Des Moines at that time because we were just starting and no one really knew who we were. Um, so, you know, we would play these shows together and there would be, in the beginning, there'd be nobody there, you know, 10 people. Um, so they started doing the radio thing, and I kept thinking, well, if they're on 107.5, pretty soon they're going to draw an audience. They, they've got to. And it just it wasn't happening. And I remember thinking, that is so weird. Well, eventually, like I said, we got our album done. Uh, I call it an album. It's so funny right now to even call it that, because like I said, it was, a live, it was a live record. So I gave this album to 103.3, and they said, this song here, uh, it all comes back to me. This, this is a radio hit. And I was like, what? They think we have a radio hit? This is amazing. So this is, again, guys, maybe two and a half, three months after I joined the band that this is happening. And uh, so we hear from Laser 103.3 that there's a show on Sunday called Local Licks that uh, plays local music. And then at the end of the Local Licks show, they have like, you know, a specialty like a segment where they're going to, you know, feature an artist. So they said this Sunday on our Local Licks show, we're going to feature 35 Inch Mutter, It All Comes Back to Me. And we're going to track the public response to the song. And, you know, look, we'll take it from there. We'll see what we'll see what the, you know, our listening audience thinks, because they can't just shove something down, you know, the throat of the public if they don't want it. Where 107.5 could do that with Slipknot. They can play Britney Spears and literally play Slipknot right after. And even if the public didn't like it, they didn't have to care because they were privately owned. Where 103.3 is Clear Channel. So they've got an agenda, right? They have to cater to record labels. Uh, the difference was if you get on 107.5, it's not that big of a deal because it's privately owned. It's like college and, you know, and metal radio. Uh, if it's privately owned, you can play anything to get on 103.3. Like that's a massive deal. So we just prayed that the song would do well on local licks and that there would be a big public response. And hopefully we can get a couple more spins. Well, fortunately for us, it all comes back to me went over huge with the public and it was the number one requested song on this local lick show for the next two weeks. And we eventually heard that the program director from Laser 103.3 wanted to meet with us. So we met with him and he pretty much struck an illegal deal <laughs> where he said, I want to promote you and push you and get your band signed. 
And when you get signed, I want, you know, either a piece of it or I want to be your manager. Well, what we didn't know at that time is that that program director was like the arch enemy of the program director of 107.5 that was pushing Slipknot. So we didn't know that because we didn't know them. Like we had just met them, right? So, you know, having heard this type of news, hey, listen, we want to put you on the radio all the time. We're like, we're in, all the way in. Let's do it, right? So they did. They started playing us on the radio every night. And I'm thinking the whole time, man, our crowd's got to be somewhat bigger from all this airplay. And, uh, you know, we got a phone call about a week after they put us on regular airplay. And they said, you're not going to believe this, but you have the number one requested song on our entire station above everything that we're playing. And I remember getting that phone call and going, you have got to be kidding me. We're the number one requested song on Laser 103.3. And he's like, yeah. Well, at that time, we had a show scheduled in Des Moines with Slipknot. And because Des Moines was from Slipknot, we would always play first. We would play and then they would play as the headliner. So... Slipknot that this whole time they're being spun on 107.5. They're playing this song only one. And we have, it all comes back to me playing on Laser 103.3 now. So I was thinking, you know, there's got to be at least 50 people that'll show up. And that'll be a new high for like both of our bands. I'm like, if if 50 people show up, I'm going to be so incredibly stoked. Because that's growth. That would be almost double the size of our normal crowd. And... I showed up to the club and it was so freaking packed. I couldn't believe it. Like you couldn't have fit another body in this club. Harry Mary's is what it was called. Uh, ended up being just under 300 people slammed into this place. 300 people in just a matter of weeks. And I'm, I was thinking, well, this has to be mutual growth. Like meaning, you know, half this crowd's probably for Slipknot, half of it's for us. Or some variation of a percentage. So we play first. And the crowd is going nuts. And when we play uh, the song, It All Comes Back to Me, it blew my mind because the crowd was singing all the lyrics. And I had wrote those lyrics. So I was like, this is mind-blowing. I mean, talk about a feeling that I will never forget. Of standing on a stage and listening to 300 people chant the words that I wrote to the song. It blew my mind. Um, but what really blew my mind is the second that we were done playing, that club emptied out. There was maybe 15 people left in there when Slipknot went on to play. And I was going, ooh, this is not good. This is not good. Hopefully Slipknot knows that, you know, we're not telling our fans to leave. The facts were, our fans didn't like Slipknot. They had heard only one. They just, they didn't like it. Uh, now, again, I want to stress, this is pre-Corey Taylor. Because uh, once Corey Taylor joined the band, everything changed. But they just, they didn't, they, they didn't work. And they all cleared out. And that night, Troy Hansen, the program director for 103.3, was also there. Uh, and so was Sophia John, the program director for 107.5. And again, they, they fucking hate each other. So, you know, Troy had his chest stuck out and he was very proud that the band that he got behind was now, you know, killing it and had a, a, a budding fan base that was growing. And he, you know, look, he should have been proud. I mean, he, he picked, you know, the band that was, you know, apparently the right one. Right. So, you know, over the course of the next, you know, couple months, our audience just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And we were now regularly selling out peoples in Ames, Iowa. We'd play there, you know, every two or three weeks we'd play a show. And standing room only, man, like you couldn't stuff another body in any venue that we played. And uh, suddenly, you know, we're calling to try to, you know, get another show with Slipknot and... Those calls are going unreturned now. And I'm sitting here going, man, this sucks because, you know, they were the other metal band, right? So it was like, 
if we play together, we can really build a music scene out of this. There'll be other bands that follow. And that eventually did happen, for sure. But I knew, I knew what they were pissed off about. I was like, they've got to be pissed that everybody cleared out at that show. Well, I later learned that there was actually a much bigger reason that they were pissed off. Um, the Deftones and Limp Biscuit were coming through to play a show in Des Moines. At that time, the Deftones uh, were just absolutely huge. And Limp Biscuits, Faith, their cover of Faith, had just broken. So they were, you know, a huge buzz band. And for us, being a rap metal band, it made perfect sense that we would open up for them. And we knew that this would be a show of 3,000 plus people. At least we thought it would be. Uh, and the show was going to be held at this place called Uncle Frogs. Now, what happens when bands like that come through on tour, local promoters bid on the show to present it, right? Well, Laser 103.3, being the big commercial rock station, they bid on the show. Well, remember when I told you Sean had money? Well, Sean was privately bidding on the show, and he was offering exorbitant amounts of money to get Slipknot on the show. To the point where the Deftones management was calling Laser 103.3 going, hey man, you know, this other act is privately, you know, bidding a huge amount of money for us to play. And this is 107.5. They're a pop station. So we don't, we don't really like know what to do here. So, and Laser 103.3 said, well, listen, man, if you want airplay from us, you know, <laughs> We're not going to get involved in this back and forth with, you know, Sean Cran and Slipknot and, you know, 107.5. We're the large commercial rock station. If you want support from us, if you want spins, if you want us to play the Deftones and Limp Biscuit, then, you know, we met your, your offer and we have a local band we want to put on as the opener. Now, a lot of touring bands do that where they'll put the, you know, what they call local support. They'll put on a local band to play first. Uh, because it only helps to bring a local audience. This created a massive rift between Slipknot and 35 Inch Mutter. And it wasn't on our end, but the rumor that we started hearing is that Clown had drawn a line in the sand. That Cran was basically saying, listen, by the way, his name is Sean Clown Cran. Um, he goes by Clown. What we heard is he was saying that 35 Inch Mutter should do the right thing. And not take this show. Because it's not fair that we're bidding more money to buy this show. And in any other market, the top bidder would get the show. But 103.3 is leveraging their power of support for other acts on you know, the record label of the Deftones and Limp Biscuit as well. To say, if you want us to support Limp Biscuit and the Deftones and other acts on your roster, we have to present this show. And you have to accept our local opener. And that's just business. It's just, that's how it goes down. Record companies at that time needed radio stations. And they had a synergy together. And one without the other, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to sell records back then if you didn't have radio. Well, Sean felt like this was bullshit. And that we should back out of the show. Either Slipknot should, should play the show because they're bidding top dollar or nobody should for the sake of the scene. Now, this is the rumor that I heard. So it's very possible that maybe Sean didn't feel that way. But we couldn't confirm it because nobody from Slipknot would return our calls anymore. So I have a feeling that's exactly how we felt. So it was something that we didn't know if we should do it or not. And we did talk about it and we did consider, well, maybe we, sh we should pass this up. And then I, you know, finally, I, I think it was me in our, you know, uh, rehearsal session. I said, what the fuck are we talking about? <laughs> We're going to say no to opening up for the Deftones and Limp Biscuit. Like, no band would say no to this. Why are we even considering saying no to this? They should totally understand that we're just in this situation where this one worked out for us. But we're cool. Like if this, 
like blows up and we get an even a bigger fan base, like let's play shows together. Let's build it together. I mean, the way I saw it, if these radio station, you know, program directors are at war, let them be at war. It'll only be a good thing for my band and for Slipknot. And let's just keep, you know, trying to build our fan bases together. If they now want to compete, you know, <laughs> in giving us shows, because 107.5 also did have other live shows they put on. They didn't get the metal bands, but they got some rock bands. And they, and they did a big summer festival that they would put Slipknot on as well which they wouldn't include us. So I was just like, you know, let the, you know, the corporate machine, let it do what it's going to do. That doesn't mean we have to carry on the same beef, but it didn't matter. The line was in the sand. And if we took that show, it was going to be the beginning of a local music scene war, a very serious one, because at this point, I definitely had my eyes on big, big things for my band. I absolutely felt as though we had what it took to share the stage with some of the biggest bands in the game. I felt like this if this goes the right way, this is our ticket to LA. And Slipknot, definitely, since the very beginning, you know, Cran was absolutely, you know, had his eyes set on the big picture too. And he had a lot of money. He had a lot of money behind him. And, you know, if you know anything about the music business, when you got a lot of money behind you, you can make things happen. So after meeting, we decided we're going to do the show. We're going to play the show. And because all of this was documented, I actually have footage from that night. And if you look at the screen right now, you will see how that night went down and what happened afterwards. So as a band, we decided to just play the Deftone show and hope for the best in the scene. The show was really something we couldn't turn down. When we got to the venue, there was this energy in the air. And then the doors opened, and the people flooded in. When I got on stage, it was dead quiet. I looked out and saw 2,000 people looking back at me. I looked at Dave, I looked at Dusty, and I thought to myself, we're here, Let's do something special. I wish I could tell you that I thought the band was amazing that night, but we weren't. We were average. But what I saw in Dusty, I will never forget. A frontman came out of Dusty that I didn't know existed. I mean, he let loose every fucking ounce of anger and pain and fury that he had. By the end of it, everybody in the crowd was pumping their fist. There was huge mosh pits. Even the security guards were screaming. And at one point, Dusty decided to crowd surf, so he leaped from the stage to the crowd. As he got rolled back on stage, he hit the corner of his eye on a monitor, and I didn't realize how bad he was bleeding until we were about halfway through the next song, and then Dusty just looks at me with this crazy look in his eye, and I look back at the crowd, and they loved it. We didn't miss a beat, and none of us will ever forget the crowd response we got as we walked off that stage. We all went home that night, and laid down just had the voices of the crowd ringing in her ears. I mean, I could still hear it today, perfectly. It was the sound of opportunity. And although all of us knew the night was a success, none of us had any idea of what was to come. Say I'm down, but I already know It all starts to build, it's a power of the mic The room 
So as you can see, things blew up to an incredible degree. We went on to play shows and tour with all, literally all of my like heroes in metal music and hardcore music. We played massive outdoor summer festivals. We played coliseums, like massive venues. I mean, I literally got to live just about every dream I ever had in the music business. Like, you know, three months after this show, you know, we were brought to Los Angeles by Rick Rubin, you know, Paul Stanley from Kiss, uh, you know, came out to our showcase and told me to my face that he was a fan of our band. Uh, you know, I got to hang out with Dave Grohl. Um, I mean, there's just so many stories I can tell you of what occurred after that. It was insane uh, what went down. And the war between us and Slipknot went to a ridiculous level where the things that occurred would blow your mind. But the point of all this was, in a matter of like six months, we went from playing our basement, to playing parties, to playing Tuesday nights, and clearing a room out, to having a fan base where we're you know playing shows in cornfields, literal cornfields, to two and three thousand kids, and then playing the Hilton Coliseum, you know, to twelve thousand, and then playing you know uh, Apple River, Wisconsin Outdoor Festival to thirty three thousand. And why did this happen? Why did this happen? The odds were completely against anything like this happening. So why did it happen? It happened because I never thought about the odds. I just tried. We just went for it. We believed in it. We dreamed. We went for it. Now, to Slipknot's credit, regardless of the war that we had, and regardless of them not getting this show, Sean Cran was a dreamer too. And he went for it. And he had all kinds of resources behind him. And as you know, they're now the biggest metal band in the world. So when you talk about odds, if you just said back then, what are the chances that two you know, metal bands could have started in an area where there is no metal, period. And they both would have had varying degrees of major success. I mean, if you look at it that way, the odds of success, because I was absolutely making a living off my music. If we want to call that success, like 100%. It was two for two. You know, if you gauge the odds by Slipknot and 35 Inch Motor, the odds that you could make it as a metal band from small town, rural farming community, Iowa, were 100%. Those are the odds, if you look at us. Now, there ended up being a local music scene of 60 plus bands, and some were really bad, but a lot were great. And there should have been a lot more success stories, and that is, that's what A Clown Show of Destiny is about. Unfortunately... Things went really weird, and uh, well, you guys will just see it. Let's just say Slipknot's beef went beyond us and became about the entire music scene. Um, but my point being is if you're a filmmaker in North Dakota and you're worried about the odds in LA, the odds matter to those who fail. You know, once if you if you come out here and you fail and you don't make it, then you could say, well, the odds were against me, that type of shit, you know, but just it, it, don't think about the odds, you know, to everybody who's made it, the odds were 100 percent, you know, because in, in their case, I'm one of one that tried this. I made it. My odds are 100 percent. Do you see what I'm saying? So the odds matter to those who fail. And there was nothing magical about what I did or versus what Sean did. I mean, the reason we both, you know, got to a place where we can make a living playing music and got to live so many dreams and do all this stuff is simply because Slipknot had a, had a clown crayon in their band and 35 Inch Motor had a Chad Kalick in their band. And we were both dreamers. 
And I'm a true believer that if you can dream it, you can achieve it. Throughout that entire time period, I never once thought about the odds. I just tried. That's the power of just trying. You know, and I'm not sticking my chest like, oh, look what I accomplished. No, my, that my point is, if more people tried, greater things would happen. And Kelly's been out there in North Dakota for five years, wondering whether or not she should try. You know, my answer to you, Kelly, is who cares about the odds? If you truly think you have what it takes to compete with the best in the world, move out here. If you don't, if you don't, then don't. But I will tell you this, the power of just trying separates you from 99% of the world. Most people have dreams, but don't go after them because they're afraid of the odds of failure. Do you know how many people in my family, how many people I know that are 60, 70 years old and have that, you know, overwhelming regret hanging over their head that they never tried, that they never went for it, that they don't know what could have been possible? You know, we did something that was so unlikely and the most unlikely of all places, but it was just effort. That's all it was. There was no magic to any of it. So it kind of goes back to that a blood red sky experiment, you know? Did I did what was this manifested? Yeah, some of that's probably true. You know. Uh like I said, hopefully in 2020, if not 2021. I'm going to re-release The Clown Show to Destiny. I made the film way back in 2004. I released a rough cut to two different film festivals, just trying to get an audience response and actually won both film festivals. Uh, won uh, the Director's Choice Award for Best Documentary at the, uh, the 2005 Park City Film Music Festival and then won the Audience Choice Award for Best Documentary at the 2005 New York International Independent Film Festival, um, which blew my mind. But again, I just tried. Uh, the reason the film needs re-edited, guys, I can't believe that it won those festivals because my filmmaking skills definitely had not caught up with my storytelling skills. And it's just very, very rough, man. It is so rough. I, I didn't even know how to do color correction at that point or even you know audio balancing. I was just laying narration over blocked out footage so it's it's just really rough and i want to recut it retell the story and a lot has happened since that makes the story even more compelling um, but i just want to leave you with this whatever your dream is just try you'll be surprised how far you can go thank you all for listening to the Inner Crowded Room podcast, episode number 86. I will be back tomorrow with more. All the best.